What's up, everybody? March 22nd, this coming Friday, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a show, screening, and Q&A. It's going to be our first full show of Left It Wall. We're going to be doing a stand-up show to open the night, a screening of the movie, and then a Q&A after. Do not wait, Pittsburgh. Get your tickets now. April 14th, Los Angeles, California. Show, screening, and Q&A. That show is going to feature members of the cast, myself, Graham Elwood, Eddie Pepitone, Anastasia Washington, Sarah K. Godot, Andrew Saxena. Do not wait. Get your tickets now, Los Angeles. And June 8th, Idlewild, California show, screening, and Q&A. Tickets and all information at romplacone.com. Episode 27, Attila the Stockbroker. Attila is a poet, a punk troubadour, a musician, a force. He started in the UK punk scene in the early 80s. Throughout this interview, he recalls being heckled by Nazis in the early 80s, seeing Black Flag's first London show, his role in organizing his local progressive football club. If you like punk rock, left-wing politics, you're not going to want to miss a minute of this. When I was in Edinburgh in 2023, sadly, Attila and I had shows at the exact same time, but he had one deviation in his schedule, so I was able to catch his show. We hung out and had a beer after. It was a pretty amazing experience. Please welcome to the show, Attila the Stockbroker. So Attila, good to see you. Thanks so much for doing this. That's fine. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's like, It was lovely to meet you at Edinburgh last year. I was, we've just been talking about the whole process. I mean, well done for, for coming over and um, and doing this, trying this great experiment that you did. Um, as I say, I mean, the, the Thanks to PBH Free Fringe, um, the Edinburgh Fringe is now, to, to, to some degree, what it should be. I mean, it's still, the, the main part of it is still horrible corporate and, 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 and a complete and utter insult to the spirit where it, which started it. And I was part of that, really, in the early 80s. I did the assembly rooms for 70% of the door um, when it was basically a squat <laughs> in 1982. Um, but yeah, I mean the the PBH free free just brought it back. You know, pay what you can, pay what you want shows, and if you if you're good and you've got a following, like uh, you know, then then it works. And I've done it for years now. It brought me back, as I say, seven years ago. And it was nice to meet you. And I'm sorry I didn't get to see your show, but as we both know, that it was on the same. We were on the same time. Yes, so, I. You know. I... I look forward to coming back to the fringe and I'm going to make sure that that conflict does not occur. I'm going to do well, it. I'm, I'm doing the same time again, you know, so, you know, and this year I'm, I'm doing, uh, because I can um, quite easily, I'm doing uh, 14 different shows in 14 days. So I've got, uh, I, I've been doing this for 43 years. I've got, I mean, I'm, I'm Put it like this, in 2004, when we were battling to save our football, soccer team, you call it, a Brighton of Albion, now playing in Europe, but then nearly extinct, I did a 10 and a half hour sponsored gig um, where I didn't even stop to have a piss because I took the mic in the toilet with me and I raised over two grand for the club. And I did that with, with and I still had material left over, even though some of it wasn't very good. And I did do an hour of covers and things. By now, I reckon I've only got 30 hours. So I'll be doing, I'll be doing 14 hours of completely different material like no no song or poem repeated twice in in two weeks of performances so i'm looking forward to that well i i really enjoyed your show i mean fortunately you did have one deviation in your schedule so i was able to catch one of your shows yes. uh so yeah I, I was very happy i was able to see you live um so let's kind of start at the beginning i i've been following you for literally 20 years now but um how did, you any- first, how did you first hear about about me by just some average was it from david rovix it was it was a combination of david rovix and also i i just uh found guy fox's table right I, sure, did, yeah. I i just found it online and i think you were the video i first saw you were singing it with david and i yeah, was yeah, like oh yeah. i know that guy who's this other guy and then i i became an an attila the stockbroker fan Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah. Yeah, David, and, David is a very good, very principled, decent guy who's written, who writes great songs. He really is. I mean, I don't agree with everything that he does, uh, but he, but he, uh, but he is a great songwriter, and he really puts himself on the line, and he he stands up for what he believes in, which is what I try and do as well. So, absolutely, I have huge respect for him. Same. Yeah, same. That's a that's a very excellent summary. So let's just kind of start at the beginning for anyone who might not be familiar with you. Um, what exactly? How would you describe what you do as Attila the stockbroker? 
Well, I mean, it, now it is so ridiculously. Uh, I, I describe myself as genre fluid. Really, I started off in 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 nine. I came out of the punk scene. I was the bass player in punk bands. The bands kept splitting up. In 1980, I was writing songs. I start, I jumped up on stage uh, in between bands, started reciting the lyrics of my of my songs from the bands that I'd been in that had split up, and developed very quickly into a into a performance poet. I'd always written poetry. Words have always been really important to me, um, and I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. In the sense that, very very soon, um, my first single, which is a spoken word single, double A side with Seething Wells, another performance poet, ranting poetry. We called ourselves Ranty Poets. It was picked up by John Peel. We played it a lot. Got me a deal with Cherry Red Records, and I've really carried on ever since. So it, essentially, I started off as a performance poet who played a little phased electric mandolin and did shouty songs. The mandolin was smashed over my head by Nazis at a fight in 1982. I got Mandola, Nelson, I call it, Nelson Mandola, which is an octave, an octave uh, lower than a mandolin and sounds a lot better. Um, and from, from then till now, I've been performing my spoken word poetry uh, and my songs all over the world. And in 1992, uh, sorry, 1994, um, I, I always knew I would. I got a band together to play them. I've always had a, an instinctive love of early music. Um, I've always wanted to combine early music and punk. So I did that a few years ago in 2018 with an album called Restoration Tragedy. I play an awful lot of early music instruments, Crumhorn, Corner Muse, um, Rausch Pfeiffer, Shawm, Bombard, plus obviously violin, viola, man, mandola, ma- mandocello, all kinds of things. Um, and, um, yeah, so I'm in a band that combines early music and punk. I'm a spoken word performer. I also have just done a dub poetry album because one of my friend's sons became a, a really big reggae producer. So basically what I've done, I've earned my living for 43 years doing what I love. And the great, greatest thing of all about it for me, it is now completely indefinable. Um, I mean, I do so many different things, but it all effectively stems from the DIY indie sort of left-wing culture that I come from and it's all connected in some way with punk in the sense that you know my dub poetry thing has came out of my I've always loved reggae and dub that came out originally from from really effectively although I knew about it before from from the love of the clash um the early music thing which is a classical thing combined with, with again with punk in the same kind of way that the pogues combine Irish music and punk uh and my and my and my sort of acoustic stuff is you know, it is folky, but with a very punky edge. You know, I actually turned David Rovix from a from a shirt, from a floral shirt wearing hippie into a into a hardcore sort of punk troubadour. Really? Um, yeah, that was me that did that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, he'll, he'll he'll be the first to to acknowledge it too. I mean, it was brilliant. You know, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's what I do. I've done it for forty three years. I'm all over the internet, I'm all over Facebook, and and uh, you know. Uh, and, and on YouTube, and you'll find me everywhere. And I'm doing all kinds of things. I'm, uh, I've just done a video um, for a festival in North Korea, which may or may not be shown. We'll wait to see. Um, which has actually come via the um, via the auspices of the EU. It's a very very long story, but also I'm going to it hmm. now because uh, I'm not a supporter of the regime of North Korea, but I am very much in in favour of um, of expanding. You know, I mean, basically. Of, of, of expanding the cultural horizons thereof and to be the first sort of Western punk band effectively to, to be on TV in the DPR, DPRK will be quite fun. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, and yeah, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. I'm writing, uh, you know, dig gigging all over the place. Um, just what I've always done really. I've, I've, I've always said, you know, I've earned my living for 43 years doing something that I would do as a hobby if I couldn't earn a living out of it. And you can't say better than that. I've just started getting my state pension. I'm 66 now. Um, and I'm not retiring in any sense. Love to hear it. Yeah, that that's incredible. I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of your early days you know, a, a lot of the stuff I hear about the early punk scenes in those days, it, it's from, you know, reading Henry Rollins books when he talks about, you know, Black Flag here in Southern California and then going over to the UK and uh, some of the bands that were around then in the 80s. And how did you perform in those rooms just armed with your words? Well, I'll tell you one thing to begin with. I saw Black Flag's first ever London show. Okay. Uh, at the 100 Club in early 1982, and it's an incredible story. 
because at the time, as well as being doing what I do as a stock broker, I was freelancing as a, as a music journalist for a newspaper called Sounds, which like most of the music press no longer exists. And, uh, you know, longer exists because of, of obviously of the digital and everything that's happened and the internet and all that stuff. Um, but, um, and the internet. And so, uh, yeah, so I, but that time I was freelancing for Sounds. I, um, I wanted to see, I'd heard about Black Flag. I wanted to see the band and they were playing at the 100 Club, which is a very well-known UK London rock venue, but which at that time for a very short period of time was, was being run, infested by Screwdriver and their mates, sort of the far-right neo-Nazi band. Uh, so I went to this gig to see Henry Rollins and ended up having a um, a long discussion, well, a 10-minute discussion in the middle of the gig with Ian Stewart, the lead singer of Screwdriver, surrounded by his acolytes, expecting to get my head kicked in. But, oh, you know, I was I was quick and everything. I, that, that didn't happen. Um, but I certainly remember the Black Flag's first ever performance in England. To put it in a nutshell, um, if, you, if you got up on stage doing what I was doing at that time, especially if you were an anti-fascist poet performing in, in venues and in, 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 in situations, where there were people in the audience who considered themselves to be fascists, then you got into fights. And our whole point about what I was doing was I was aiming, you know, I was ta- aiming to take poetry to places where it doesn't normally go. And I was aiming to convince people, you know, of the of, of, of the error of their ways if they were involved or influenced by sort of far right ideology. And since most of the people at the gigs weren't convinced fascists, but 15, 16 year old working class kids who just been had shit all their lives on being lied to by a load of older people who were saying, yeah, if you come at this gig, you can beat up some lefties. Um, I, you know, I was very successful in that, although I did get a lot of stick and I did get into a lot of aggro. Um, but you know, we came through it, but it was, I mean, when you try and explain to people now what it was like in the early eighties, you know, not just in London, but all over the UK, where you will go to a gig knowing that there was going to be a fight. And knowing that there would be trouble with right wing bonnets, knowing that, 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 you know, I mean, it's just, it was an incredible time. I mean, it's, you know, when I think of some of the things that I got up to and some of the things that happened in those days, you know, bloody hell, that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's just impossible to explain it now because it doesn't happen now, fortunately. Um, there's a, a, an even bigger threat from the far right now than it was then because they're not, they don't wear boot dot martins and shave their heads anymore. They're in government and they're and looking like, you know, it's a possibility they might get into government in the US. And, you know, and, and obviously right across mainland Europe, it's a completely different culture. Many things have got better. Let's not forget that, um, you know, in terms of all the other types of absolute garbage, the racism, the sexism, the homophobia that was just open in, in the early 80s that isn't there now. Loads of that's got better. And of course, they're trying to turn the clock back about that. But in terms of um, in terms of gigs, uh, you know, it was shit then. It really was. Um, it was incredibly inspiring. And um, people say to me, "Don't you get nervous before before shows?" And I'm playing a nice, you know, hundred seat sort of hall somewhere or back room in a pub, packed with my fans. Do you don't you get nervous? I said, "Well, I started off in 1980, and I was getting chairs and 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 bins and and glasses thrown at me, and was attacked on stage by Nazis a few times, and had my mandolin smashed over my head." Uh, so it's playing to nice a lot of to playing to you lot who come to see me and are really nice and friendly and want to buy my stuff. No, I don't get nervous at all. It's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's it. I mean, it, you know, it was incredible. I mean, some of the stuff that went on was absolutely incredible. But it was, but one of the things that that honed my skills as a performer was that I knew. So w- whether or not they were fascists or whatever, because most of the time it was they were. I mean, you know, it wasn't like every single gig there was trouble. Um, you know, at certain gigs you would know there was going to be trouble, but um, a lot of the time there were just big audiences who come to see a band, and you were going on, you were doing the support, and it was up to you to get them in with a style of performance that hadn't been seen before, because this is the other crucial thing, of course. I started right at the beginnings. I mean, the, the, the ranting poetry thing that we started in the early 80s coincided with the beginnings of the, what was beginning, what was called in the first place was called the alternative comedy scene, uh, which then became, um, it started off, sorry, well, it started off as a new variety. So it was basically bills with people like me, jugglers, you know, face painters, mime artists and comedians. Then it became... Um, then it became alternative comedy with the inf- because that was the thing that was most commercially viable, um, and so more and more and more was comedians. But I still did those gigs, and then it was kind of new comedy, and then it was comedy. By which time, you know, I didn't fit in, I didn't feel part of it anymore because the whole culture that I was from was that the people were coming to to just to listen. 
and and you know and to be inspired and entertain but not specifically to hear jokes or or at a venue where the yardstick was or the gig where the yardstick was it's a success if people are laughing because that's not what I do as you know I love to make people laugh my humor is a huge part of what I do but I I, I say humor my slogan is love humor hate comedy because I love making people laugh but five minutes later I want to make them cry and I hate the relentless um you know idea that of stand up that that if you don't get you know 20 laughs in in 10 seconds then you're you know i've got a poem about this which i think i've told you about called comic in a basket which if you haven't heard it already you should it's on the internet i'm sure you'll find it um which is just about how it's how it started you know um when i started off in the in the early 80s you know uh and it changed from being just anything goes to precisely being that kind of gag every 10 seconds Gag if we take 10 seconds all your history. Script writing comedy. Script writing gag team. Comedy factory. Roll on, roll off. Are you with the agency? Too t- controversial. No good for TV. Comedy to go. Careers in comedy. Comic in a basket. Comedy package. Corporate hospitality. Comic in a basket. 70s TV advert shopping. Routine, routine. 70s TV old people shopping. Routine, routine. Very funny. Daily Express. Comic in a basket. Hilarious. Daily Mail. Comic in a basket. Get your dicks out for the banks and give your sponsors grateful thanks. You know, I mean, that's just a little bit of it. I, I've done it for years, so I can't even remember it properly. But yeah, it was all about that, really. But yeah, I mean, I, I've i always followed my own path, done my own thing, and I'm happy to say I've always earned my living at it. I've always have lots of people interested in what I'm doing, and I've never, ever been famous or kind of flavour of the month in the mainstream at all, but always had it's always words and i i know that i've always said my my mantra is i want to be as well known as as i get but entirely on my own terms i'm not interested in fitting in with anybody or fitting yeah. into anyone else's agenda i just do my own thing Uncon- oh, you know that's that's me you know it's like it's like just me on my own terms that's what i do like well you know, this is me like it or t- take it or leave it you know, <laughs> simple, simple as that you're an inspiration to everyone trying to do the same. And, and and when you when you're describing the comedy thing, it you hit upon why I really enjoy. Uh, and I know we kind of this kind of just came, came up organically, but I wanted to ask you about it more specifically. Um, things like the Edinburgh Fringe, where you're working on an hour show. So as a stand up, there is still that pressure of, you know, the laughs per minute and stuff like that. But when you're doing an hour and it's like a conceptual hour show that people came to see, you can kind of take them on a journey where you do like a story or something like that. You might not want to open with it, but you can kind of once they trust you, you know, you you don't have those pressures quite as much and you can take them on a different journey. And that's why I really migrate to things you know, like the Fringe Festival world and, and stuff like that. Um, so I was wondering, could could you speak a little bit? And, and again, some of it came up organically, but, um, you know, just the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and how that played a role in your career, past and present, because your article was incredibly brilliant. Well, thanks. I mean, I would say it's it, it's because I never set out to get spotted or, you know, I never get reviews when I go to Edinburgh. No one takes any notice of me from the movers and shakers. I don't expect them to. Um, they know I'm there. They're not interested. Um, going right back to the early 80s when I started to do it, it was a completely different time. As I say, I played the, the assembly rooms, which for those, obviously, since this is mainly a, a US sort of th- um, um, podcast, most people won't know what that is. The assembly rooms is the most prestigious venue at the at the, at the fringe. And it's now you have to pay thousands of pounds a week now, tens of thousands to get a slot there. When I started, it was we did it for seventy percent of the door on a door split, and there was me and Ceiling Wells and Little Brother and Ben Zephaniah and Jules Denby, just punk poets, you know, seventy percent of the door between us. Um, so basically, I mean, it had it, it. It's always been just something that I've enjoyed doing for for a period from from eighty two to about ninety one. I enjoyed doing it. And then it all changed and it stopped being um, sort of door splits and everything and became this corporate horribleness where you basically have to pay in advance to get the, to get to get the room and all the rest of it. And then you got a door split after a certain – it was just basically you went up there and you lost money. Now, this is my living, all right? This is my living. I earn my living as a performer. So I'm not going to do gigs where I don't make money. And the idea that I might get spotted by a TV show or, or get or get an advert for Coca-Cola or something out of it. I mean, I won't do those things. I've been offered, you know, Nike and all kinds of 
garbage. I won't do that, that sort of shit. I'm not interested in it. Um, and I'm not interested in fitting into anyone's stupid TV character shows or whatever either. I just do what I want. So, so basically for me, that while it was a place where I could do gigs and get a percentage of the door, brilliant. When they started telling me you've got to pay to play, that was bollocks. So I was off. Um, uh, cause of course the other side of what I do is, you know, I mean, I'm doing all these gigs all over the place and August is a huge time for festivals. And I do a lot of music festival gigs. I used to, um, beginning to wind those down now because i'm really not into camping anymore it's one of the few things that age has done um but um so so there was all these other gigs for me to do all the festivals and everything so i just stopped and then precisely a few years ago i it was about 2014 or something i heard about this new um concept where instead of paying for these ridiculously expensive tickets where you well when you go to a venue they they charge you x amount of pounds a week to have a spot in their venue then you, then they sell tickets and you get a percentage of the ticket money um which normally in many cases is nowhere near enough to cover the costs of of of, of the rent that they call it that you've paid to hire the slot and that instead there's a new system where basically the venues don't charge people to come in You've got a bucket at the end of the gig. They put what they want in the bucket and you get that. And nobody, nobody's, nobody pays to, uh, to come in and the venues make their money, obviously, from the food and drink they sell to the people that come to watch the performances. It's a brilliant idea. It works fantastically. And as long as you've got an audience, it really works from a financial point of view too, because people, you know, they're at the fringe to be blunt, blunt. Mostly they're the kind of middle class people that can afford to pay for a show. And they don't, they don't treat me any differently to anyone else for the most part. But the, but those people, but the other side of it, which I, I find absolutely brilliant, absolutely, you know, is the fact that the, the, the work people from the street or people who never afford to go to a show normally can turn up and pay nothing and just come and see me. And loads of the Edinburgh punks and, you know, I get probably get a higher percentage of people with Scottish accents at my shows than most. Because I've got a pretty good following there. I have a pretty good following everywhere, really, in, in the punk scene, in my underground scene. And they know they can come and watch a tiller. And oh, if they can afford it, they put, you know, they put some money in. If they can't, they don't have to. That is what is so brilliant about the Free Fringe. I mean, it really is. Um, and that's why I came back. And I'm doing it again this year. It'll probably be my last one this year. I mean, I because I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, you know, show this year is 14 different shows in 14 days. Now, I've got enough material. Uh, to do that so 14 shows with no song or poem um performed more than once obviously chronicling the 43 years 44 years now that i've been at the stockbroker so yeah i mean but i would say in general i mean you make a, you've obviously made a big thing about the edinburgh fringe something that you've really wanted to do i completely understand that for me it was never to be honest it's never a big deal at all it was just something that i did <coughs> and then stopped doing and now i'm doing it again it's just a couple of weeks having fun and I'm fortunate enough now to have uh, the the aunt of a friend of mine has got a place right in the centre of town, uh, so I can, and I can stay with her. So I don't have the problem with the with the accommodation either, which is the yeah, absolute pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, I was staying with with mates, uh, you know, fans, whatever. It works for me. I'm fortunate. I've got you know, I've got this following, uh, <clears throat> and people have always been pretty supportive of what I do because they know that I don't have corporate backing and I'm not interested in that, and so it works. Anyway, so there you go. Yeah, I, I mean, it's uh well, when I saw your show, I, I, I my feedback, like like my thoughts on it was in the same hour, I laughed, I cried, I cheered, uh, I sang along and I wanted to call my dad as soon as I had a chance. And yeah, well, uh, that, that was <laughs> that, that, that was how I felt. I loved it. I mean, I loved your show. Well, thank you. I mean, you see, that is the very point of what I do. I always say, you know, we as human beings, we laugh, we cry, we think. I mean, I would literally do. In an hour, I will do a, a, a long poem sometimes about my mother's f- seven-year battle with Alzheimer's. And in the same hour, I will be doing poetry about the fact that I've just become poet in residence of the National Pooh Museum. I may be doing, I'll be doing knob gags. I don't know what the American translation of that is, but you know what I mean. Dick yeah, jokes. We, we know. Yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah. I'll be doing all <laughs> kinds of different things. So and I go from the sublime to the ridiculous, from the, from the very, very stupid to the... um you know to the very very um serious in 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 a space of nothing um so yeah absolutely well and and i don't want to talk too much about your show to to you know like like uh i want people to go see it but but when you talked about the the evolution of your relationship with uh with i, I believe your stepdad i, I mean yeah. that was just 
that's just really powerful stuff, man. I mean, that, I mean, it, it brought me to tears and, and I wasn't alone. I was looking around at the people sitting yeah, around right. me. Yeah. Um, and, and that, that was, maybe the, really... that may be the best poem I've ever done. The point about it is that all, but each show is different. I've always, you know, I mean, and, and, and what I do generally, I mean, because of the very nature of what I do, I can go to different places, different venues, different types of people, different, you know, I can play at a punk gig. I mean, I'm next week I'm going to, I'm going to Ireland. I'm doing a hardcore punk gig in, in Dublin. I'm doing a kind of theatre show in Belfast. I'm doing a folk club in in, in, in Derry. Um, and I'm, I'm doing two gigs in Scotland on the way and the way back, so I don't fly anymore, so I'm going I'm driving and then getting the boat across. Um, and every gig's different, and every gig, to some degree, the, the material will be tailored to the audience that is there. I mean, because some people, if you're doing a, a gig which is full of punk rockers, they're going to get every single reference if you do a, a if you're talking about about precisely about that early 80s, about the scene, about the, the violence that was endemic in the system, you know, at that time in the punk scene. Um, and obviously, if you're doing a sort of a more poetry sort of orientated thing, they're not going to, in the main, although obviously if there's people there that know my stuff, they will get both. But, but you know, it just varies. And it is very, very sort of um, very varied and very um, and very kind of uh, diverse what I do and the, and the venues that I do and the, and the whole thing that I do is diverse. And that's what I love about it. And, of course, I've got my band, uh, so, you know, that's another another dimension as well. We're playing, you know, with the band, I can do completely different shows, completely different places. And that works, you know, I mean, and, you know, I'm playing obviously in a rock environment more, but the band also, we can do a, um, a semi-acoustic or acoustic performances in churches or whatever, doing the early music side of what we do. And we can play a hardcore punk gig with the best of them because we've got an awful lot of really good hardcore punk rock songs. So, you know, um, it all fits together. You uh, also incorporated uh, your illness into your show, which thrilled to hear that that you uh, that you beat it. Um, but uh, be, yeah, no, it seems to be all right. Yeah, I had yeah. bladder cancer. I had bladder cancer, and I mean, I, I I started off writing a poem about 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 well, basically the whole point about what I did after I got this. I went to the doctor straight away when I I knew something wasn't right, and I've been treated, and it looks like I'm okay. I have been okay for nine years. Um, you know, I've been okay for nine years anyway. So, um, and, um, and the whole point about that was to, you know, above everything to get people, especially people of my age who tend not to talk about these things so much Mm -hmm. to go to the doctor, um, if there's something wrong with them. And especially given that I had it in my bladder, um, you know, I could make great big sort of a great big, you could make it funny, you know, the whole thing of experience of having a camera going where no camera should ever go, you know, um, and, 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 um, and, and it made it funny. So it was the absolute combination of what I love to do best, which is to be just be silly and make a very serious point. I mean, one of my probably my favorite, um, if you like, epithet in the in the world of performance I've ever heard is actually a quote from Mary Poppins. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. That sure. for me is absolutely the, the starting point for what I do. The starting point for what I do. I mean, because if you make people laugh, I mean, this, this is the point. Well, I get another thing where I, well, I have a beef with comedy, you know, You're laughing for its own sake. When I make people laugh, I want to make them laugh so that they are ready for the next bit, which isn't going to be funny. So, that, you know, when you say that you make them laugh at the beginning so that then you can do a story or something which maybe isn't full of belly laughs and they'll trust you. I start off from that premise with what I do because I, mm-hmm. because I, the, the, the kind of, the atmosphere that you have at a comedy show isn't there. In other words, people are not expecting to be laughing all the time. They're just listening, they're expecting to be entertained and to make to think and to laugh sometimes, you know. Um, and I, and I obviously quite know what I do is funny. Um, but the whole point is that when I, I start off so I can do the, the funny stuff, you know, if you like, and people are having a good time. And then I do the really serious bit, whether it's about, about illness or whether it's about, um, you know, uh, personal relationships and, and reconciliation or obviously all the unspeakable political shit that's going on in the world that needs to be talked about and the hypocrisy and the garbage and everything. Now, all these things, they all fit together. Uh, so, um, so you know, and, that, and that's the point. I mean, that's why, for me, as I say, why I stopped being part of the, the comedy scene, um, despite the fact that, uh, yeah, I mean, I could do an hour of, of funny stuff, I mean, funny poems and songs, without any doubt at all, but that would only be a little bit of what I do. And it wouldn't fit into the, a lot of people's vision of what comedy is now anyway, because 
it, they think of it as being a stand-up sort of stream of consciousness thing. And I'm not, I don't improvise. I don't take, I don't have heckle. I mean, I say, you know, heckling. Well, I, I used to be heckled. I used to have dustbins thrown at me and to being attacked on stage by Nazis. You know, that was my, you know, I don't, I don't need to be heckled. They don't want people to listen to me. You know, that's the whole, you know, thing. You know? I've done my, I've done my, I've done my stint with hecklers in the, in the early eighties. I'm, I'm, I don't want that anymore. So uh, this wasn't on my list to talk about, but because we were kind of talking about it off mic, I, I, I kind of wanted to ask you uh, ask you about this. Um, you recently got back from Rome, where you had some uh, some things happen with some uh, some football fans. So let me premise this by saying, here in the states, um, kind of like the combination of football and politics is a little bit newer here. Where, you know, we have like Portland has a big Antifa following. Uh, my favorite team is a my, my favorite U.S. team is a minor league team called the Pittsburgh Riverhounds. And they we're talking, have. We're talking, we're talking what you call soccer here. Yeah, not American. Yes. Football. Yeah, yeah we're talking in, soccer. With, with American football, I, I, there's no real politics at all apart from the no. politics of capitalism. I get that. No, um, no, no. I've I got to start off by saying that that's similar in the U.K. In the U.K., um, apart from Celtic and Rangers, there there is very little overt uh, political um, sort of activity of any kind. It, it's rather frowned on in our in our culture. Really, people don't particularly want to see it. Although, mm-hmm. obviously, what is defined as politics is is people's lives, and so something I it just comes in anyway. But in mainland Europe, absolutely, there are loads and loads of teams with sadly too many with far right followings, some with far left followings. We encountered. Um, some of Roma's far, we were playing AS Roma, my team, Brighton over Albion, for the first time in, in, in Europe, in the European competition. So a really exciting time for us got there. Um, you know, mo- most people had a really good time, but a couple of people got stabbed and robbed. And, you know, it's, it's, I mean, that, um, I mean, I, my, my, I mean, you talk about the Edinburgh Festival, the, the, the sort of extra, the extra performance thing, which I suppose has had most influence with me. Of, 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 of all is is football and my love of Brighton of Albion, my team, and the fact that in the nineties we were nearly destroyed by property speculators. And I personally founded the Independent Supporters Association, co-founded our Independent Supporters Association, and led the battle to save the club when we were bottom with the fourth division. And our ground had been stolen. And now, those of you who follow soccer in the states will know that we're even if you don't support us. Uh, we're, we're in the top and we're playing Manchester United and Liverpool and those people every week. We finished sixth in the table last year. And that, and I'd always say the battle to save Brighton Nova Albany is the most successful grassroots campaign that I've ever been involved in. And I was poet in residence at the club for many years and was the stadium announcer, match day stadium announcer. In other words, playing the music, so punk, ska and reggae and announcing the teams and everything. I had a mate who did it with me because I was sometimes always off gigging, obviously. But, uh, yeah, I was, and so that, that's been a very, very important part of my life. And the fact that towards the end of my life, we finally got, got to play in the sort of major European competitions it means a hell of a lot to me. It really does. It really does. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a dream come true. That's incredible. So, so I'm a little curious. Is 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 Roma then a right wing team, or is that just some of their following? Of their following. Well, Lazio, the other team, is 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 a really really fascist, notorious fascist club. Okay, right up to the right up to the the institutions. So it's horrible. Uh, <clears throat> Roma used to be a left wing club, but it's it's very diverse now. There's still left wing groups and there's right wing groups. Um, <coughs> I personally didn't see any trouble, but I know that some people had some aggro. Um, but I don't really want to talk too much about that, really, because I mean, it's like that's an extra sort of thing, really. I mean, it's not. I mean, if you if you're interviewing me for this, then the most important thing for me to talk about is my roots and culture in, you know, in performance and in the punk scene and everything. And and um, you know, we've done a lot of that. So I mean, so you know, I mean, I've, 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 you may know, may not know, I've toured the states four times um, with David Rovix three times and with TV Smith once. Uh, very, very interesting, um, incredibly diverse crowds in terms of number because we could have a really good crowd one day and then hardly anyone the next. Um, and obviously we went down the East Coast and the West Coast and the bit in the middle. I've never been to the South. Everyone said, oh, you can't go down there. They'll, they'll hate you. And I, my response to that is, well, there's there's people that are going to be into it wherever you go. Uh, there so are. Sensible, yeah. The people that turn up. I've toured Canada six times. I've played the, the Calgary Stampede once, for God's sake, which is the – epitome of the whole sort of it's like you know yeehaw sort of the, the, what you get in in texas or whatever and i went down fine just i mean as long as you're sensible and clever uh you know you you, you can do it and i've toured australia so four times new zealand three times canada 
six times, the States four times, all over mainland Europe. I speak French and German. So I performed all over the world with this stuff, and and um, and I love it. I mean, as a linguist, I especially like performing in Germany because I speak Ger- – I, le- I toured East Germany before the war came down four times, and that's where I learned German. And I do loads and loads of gigs in Germany now. Quite, and, you know, I do I do my introductions and, and bits of my material actually in German, which Are you is fluent? a different thing, you know. That's a, a really – I love that. I speak fluent French, but sadly I don't really have a following in France. So I only get much opportunity to perform there. But, you know, it's still, um, you know, I love I love languages. I always have done. It's just a natural thing for me. You know? So, so are, are you fluent in German as well or, or, or conversation? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, wow. Je suis un fluent Deutsch et je parle couramment français. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I mean, but I use my German a lot more because because of the history of punk and because of the history of the sort of politics and culture there, I've always had a better, because basically the Germans understand English better than the French. So as someone who's known as a performer using words, I have more, I obviously, the, the main areas where people are interested in what I do are English speaking countries, all countries where they speak English very well because their own um, language is extremely narrow, like say Holland or Scandinavia, where very few people in the world speak, speak, speak their languages. So they all learn English really well. And that obviously is a, is a major thing too. Because uh, traveling has always been a big part of what I do. I love performing abroad. I love touring abroad. And it's always meant a lot to me to be able to go to different countries and do this, you know. So, I mean, you think I, you'll I, come back to the States? Is it on the list? No, I've, 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 um, I've done, I mean, you know, I've, 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 I've done four tours. I, I had a really good time, as with Canada and Australia and New Zealand. You know, I've, I mean, I mean, there's, there, there's no, I mean, I've still got the, the energy levels I've always had in many ways, but. I'm very much aware of my limitations now. I don't, I feel a little bit vulnerable with all the things that's wrong with me. And I've done that. And the other thing, which is fundamental, is that I absolutely hate flying. Mm -hmm. If I tell you that I have done that all these different tours, six tours of Canada, four tours of the States, blah, 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 I've hated every single minute that I've been on an aeroplane. I mean, that gives you, so that allied to the obvious fact that there is a moral imperative on us all now, in my view, to, to fly as little as possible. And I'm not saying people shouldn't fly. But since I hate it, since I've done all those things many times, since I've got loads more opportunities, and since now, of course, we can do something like this, and I can communicate with the people that enjoy my stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, on the stats on Spotify or whatever, I mean, obviously, the, the, the second biggest number of people that listen to my stuff after the UK is Germany, and then it's the US. I've got little pockets of fans everywhere. I've been over there. Quite often, the people that love my stuff didn't hear that I was playing when I and didn't know that I was playing when I was over there. It's quite funny. Yeah, I played in your. your Why well, haven't you never been here? Well, actually, I've played Pittsburgh or somewhere. I've played there three times or twice. You know, oh, that's well, my I, hometown. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why didn't I know? Well, I mean, fuck. You know, um, one of the interesting things about about touring with David was that I was playing in his circuit, which is mm. basically the lefty folky circuit, and my audience o- often didn't know about the gigs because. Much, although we tried our hardest, they were promoted in the lefty folky circuit, uh, and to, for the main in the in the main in the main area. And of course, at that time, because it was a long time ago, there wasn't as much. You know, the internet didn't go as far as we and we could. I mean, now it's a lot easier to to advertise anywhere you go. I mean, this is. I mean, for somebody like me, there is so much. I would say there is so much shit on the on 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 social media. It's hideous. But if you use it the right way, if you control it, I mean, I've got a Facebook page with 50,000 followers and I control those 50,000 followers. I don't allow racism and sexism. I don't allow just mindless trolling or, or everybody who's on there. You don't have to agree with me, but you have to, you have to express your opinions yourselves rather than putting up memes or, or, or links. And you have to, you have to treat people with respect and decency and be articulate. And on that basis, I've established, a, I'm very proud, I've established a really good community because, as, as I think you know, you read my stuff sometimes, I, I, it started off, I mean, you know, I'm not just somebody who promotes my gigs and puts poems and songs up there. I write a lot about current events and football and all, all kinds of things. And I do it in a way which people find entertaining, thankfully, to the point where quite a lot of the people on there now, people have never heard of me in terms of a performer. They just enjoy what I write, so they go on my page, and that's great. I love it. I absolutely love that. 
Well, and you also, I mean, I've discovered other musicians because of you. I mean, I mean, you'll yeah. host people and, and things like that. Jess Silk yeah, I mean, is also on the show. One of the things that I've always been very happy and proud to do is I've always tried to encourage my fellow performers. I run this festival, Glastonwick, you know, I've been doing it for 27 years. I've, I've put on an awful lot of gigs locally. And, and, you know, one of the things I absolutely love is, is I've created this network and there's an awful lot of people that have met each other and gone on to new things because they've, you know, because they threw me, which is brilliant, absolutely fantastic, and I love mm-hmm. that. I, mean, I do absolutely love it. Uh, you know, I am an organizer. I'm very, I'm hi- highly motivated. Got a lot of energy. I tend to really get stuck into things, and and it's be- and, and as I say, I'm beginning to uh, to I'm beginning to have to watch it a little bit now. And it's funny because I don't think of myself as being a particular age, but you know, you do. You know, I, I have to start thinking about that now a little bit. But I'm still firing in all cylinders, and hopefully, will continue so for many years. What does Joe Strummer mean to you? To just Joe kind of put it the, in words. Uh, well, I mean, you've heard my song "Commandante Joe," I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, that sums it up, really. I mean, I always say my dad was my first influence. He was an amateur comic poet. He died when I was ten. He was. He was. I, I was writing little poems and songs when I was a little kid. He was fifty-nine when I was born. He retired, you know, soon afterwards. So he was there all the time. Um, my second biggest influence was a Sussex poet called Hilaire Belloc. Who, who, there was a, 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 um, a book of comic poems called um, Cautionary Tales for Children, which I absolutely loved, um, basically, um, you know, in those early days. Then I got into music and bowling. I mean, you know, I was 10 or 11, I heard King of the Rumbling Spires, Tyrannosaurus Rex. I'm a huge Mark Bowling fan. A bowling is not I know particularly well known in the US, but he, you know, he was a big star in the UK. Um, it is it, a sort of very basically proto punk uh, in, in a lot of ways, but, but very, very starting off sort of very acoustic, and then and then and became a monster of a rock band. Um, and then the Velvets, Mott the Hoople, David Bowie, and and for always for me the most important thing, well as important as the music was the words. The words were always fundamental and important as well. So I did all of that. And then uh, it was completely, lo- when punk happened in 76, it was completely logical to me. But the difference, the extra dimension with punk was that these, you know, people were saying, well, you know, you can do this. You know, it's, you don't have to wait to be signed. You don't have to have an agent. You don't have to have a manager. You can get out there and do it. And and that was what was so brilliant because we all started putting out our own records. And, and Strummer, to me, you know, Strummer was my greatest inspiration. Um, and I wrote this song, Commandante Joe, because I never, I, I'm, I'm quite, quite, sort of unusual in a sense I never wanted to meet my heroes um, and so I never met Strummer um, I, but I, I thought I would do one day you know and, and then he just died suddenly I thought well, I'll put my arm around him one day when we're both 80 and say thank you mate you know but I mean it's like you know then suddenly he died so I wrote this song Commandante Joe which just sums up how I feel you know although I never met you I'm so sad to see you go because you wrote the soundtrack for my life Commandante Joe there's actually a, a Strummer um, picture uh, on in my if, you, if, if I turn around there and you mm-hmm. can see there's a picture. There's a, a, a actually a, it's a kind of stencil thing that a school kid did of Joe Strummer and gave to me when I had a school gig that I was doing. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously the punk, the Clash. Um, uh, I mean, I've got so many different inspirations in music, but the Clash will be the greatest inspiration of all, along with T Rex and the Velvets. I mean, I love the Velvets. Absolutely love them. I mean, it's one of the things I despair about your country right now. How. Now, country which produced John Steinbeck and the Velvet Underground could produce Donald Trump and this <laughs> whole, and, and on the other side, the, 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 you know, the choice between, between the, the hideous, ghastly Trump thing and, and the, the, the military industrial complex as represented by, by Biden. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just such a ghastly thing because you know exactly what I mean when I say that, I mean, Trump is hideous. Yeah. But 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 some of the things that make people revolt against Biden and go to Trump are are simply because Biden represents the elite in its most pure and, and, and unified military industrial complex um, sort of globalist form. And yeah. Trump represents it, a nasty sort of America first version of the same thing, pretending that he's going to care about ordinary Americans when obviously he doesn't. But you know, it's it's and, and and the fact that there is no alternative, the fact that the fact that the that the media, that the corporate world, has 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 made it impossible for somebody like Bernie Sanders to 
to really, you know, be, I mean, and, uh, as with the UK, the fact you have this electoral system where only two people could compete, two parties could compete. Because Bernie Sanders, should, in, in, you know, in a, in a, in a real, in a, in, a, in a democratic country, the, the constituency that represents Bernie Sanders to, to really, really make it um, uh, simplistic, the constituency represented by Bernie Sanders, the constituency represented by, by Joe Biden and the constituency represented by by what, whatever Ralph Nader and all those things has become, and all the and all the sort of left alternatives should be able to each vote for its own slate, right. and then uh, under a proportional representation system, form a government based on an alliance instead of it having to be a binary choice between something which is absolutely beyond the pale, unspeakable fascist evil, and something which is. Um, which is domestically much, much better. I think it's fair to say. Uh, my, my assessment of Biden is that for, for, in terms of his domestic policies, um, much, much better than Trump, obviously. But in terms of the global thing, um, you know, yeah. I mean, God, the, the business in Palestine is just beyond belief. Yeah. Absolutely beyond yeah. belief. Yeah. I mean, I mean you, you summed it up very well. I, I, I think much, much better. I, I don't think I'd go that far but he has had a few decent domestic appointments you know to the ftc and and stuff like that so there there have been i I mean but given that this is the only choice presumably you'd rather buy trump yeah i mean if if you put yeah i mean i mean if you're gonna i mean we're fighting there are many people on the left or of our sort of perspective now who are literally going to say i don't because people say in this country are saying between between uh um, Starmer and, and, and Sunak that there's no difference. That's absolutely not true. I mean, that really is not true. I mean, do most people on the left still recognise that there is a difference between Biden and Trump? Most people on the left, the general consensus on the well, I, I mean, I, honestly, Attila, I, I would say there isn't really a general consensus on the left yeah, of the yeah, United States yeah, right yeah. now because because things are just so divisive. Yeah. But um, but I, I think my personal take, and I know many share this. Um, is there no difference? No, there's not no difference, but, uh, they're not different enough. That's the big problem, which I think is basically what you said too. Like like they're, they're not different enough. So what many of us are fighting for is to try to build, you know, kind of an alternative structure, like what you're talking about. And and it depends on, and a lot of it, you know, and we don't have to get like too far in the weeds here, but like, a lot of it depends on where you live. Like as somebody who lives in California, um, the possibilities that are available to me uh, electorally are a little different than somebody who lives in a state with like closed primaries, for instance, where you yeah. really have to join one of the two parties. You don't really have a choice. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's go ahead. It's most completely screwed about the US politics. And I'm a student of politics and I do understand it. Is the is this electoral college, which obviously started yeah. at the beginnings of of the white colonization of, of of America, and it was an attempt to give representation to all areas of the country. And at that time, then there was, I, I guess, there was some sort of justification for it. But the fact now that, the, to be blunt, the vote of a of a of, a, of some redneck in in um, Wyoming is worth the, um, the, that of three college. Uh, graduates in in California is completely completely ludicrous. The fact that you know that I mean, however awful Clinton was, she wasn't as bad as Trump. She won the popular vote, and she didn't get elected. You know, and Trump is saying that he was. Trump is saying that that the vote was stolen. This ludicrous vote was stolen thing, when seven million people voted more, more seven million people majority voted for for for, uh, for biden and trump is saying that on the basis that, that of, of of you know these putative things at the in the, the electoral college in this in this in the swing states which it's you know the, the idea that that you have an electoral college that can do that is yeah. just completely bizarre because there's no way that 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 trump is going to win the popular vote is there i mean not in a million years is there? i highly is there? doubt it yeah i i, I highly highly doubt it that he could win via the electoral college with all the gerrymandering and the vote suppression that's going on and i mean you know and and, and i mean it would be a I mean, it would be a disaster for them looking from the outside it will be a disaster for the world if trump gets in again i mean some people on the left here say, you know, if the Americans want to vote for him, then that's their business. 
and at the very least there won't be so much a ghastly sort of shit going on in the rest of the world because Trump is America first and he won't he won't throw money yeah. at Israel or Trump would continue the same things Biden yeah. is doing in that regard. I mean, he really would. Yeah. He said he would. He, oh, he said, said he, I mean, he, yeah, I mean, he said he would. I, I mean, he, I, he's, saying, he's just said that he wouldn't give him, he wouldn't give another penny to Ukraine or something. Is that, have you heard that? I mean, was that, was that somebody else saying that? I mean, I don't know. I just heard a headline today. I don't know whether it's, I don't know. well, he, he definitely said he would continue what's going on in Gaza. I right. mean, he, he has, he has, he has made it out like Biden hasn't been hawkish enough in that regard. Well, he's, which, I mean, Jared Kushner again, and all that are obviously totally, you know, in, in with Netanyahu. I mean, that's clear. Absolutely, totally clear. It's the whole thing, I mean, right around the world now, is the, the rise of the far right is, is absolutely frightening. And, 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 you know, given what I, given that I was born in 1957, so, so um, you know, 12 years after the end of the Second World War, we really defeated the shit the first time around. Given that I fought it on the street literally in the 80s, I mean, it's for somebody like me to see this coming back. It's just, it's just disgusting. And 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 you know, I mean, we have it in the UK as well. I mean, I, I think Labour is going to win the election. I mean, you know, I think I have told you my wife is a Labour councillor, and I'm in the Labour yes. Party, but very much clinging on uh, with what's going on at the moment. But well, um, what, what is what exactly is because I I know that, and again, like like there's, I, I mean, you have way more insight into American politics than I can as as far as UK politics. I, I usually get it. From musicians, I like to tell you the truth, but yeah. um, I know that Labour started kind of going in a like during the Blair days. They almost started going in the American direction of, of not really representing the people at all, and now it seems like Labour is, is kind of becoming more grassroots again. Is, is that accurate, or is that happening? Yeah, well, it, 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 that was accurate. What you said first, it was accurate. It became a lot more grassroots when Jeremy Corbyn was elected in two thousand and seventeen. <coughs> we had a big movement to win the 2017, 2016, sorry. We had a big movement to win the 2017 election. We lost narrowly. Um, and, and then we lost, and then, and then 2019, we lost heavily because the right wing media really came down on Corbyn. And now Starmer is, is basically making the Labour Party, um, much more right wing. A lot of people have been expelled for being on the left. Um, because basically the press in the UK is so right wing. It's, it's, it's the press. The worst thing about the UK is the press. It is, I mean, it's my, my generation who, who, who win elections. And sadly, it is the over sixties who, who, who vote in, in the majority and who are the most right wing and they read right wing newspapers. And it just, I mean, I am a mind. I think people of my age are in about a 35% majority, whereas people of 20, there's about, one percent they're going to vote Tory. It's just unbelievable. You know, I mean, I, I write a lot about how my generation took all the very benefits from. You know, I grew up from in a working class family. I was the first person in my family to go to university. I went there on a full grant. You know, I had all the opportunities that the welfare state provided, and now my generation is taking that away from their own children and grandchildren. It's disgusting. Anyway, mate, I've got to go soon. I've got oh actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up. So, from yeah. Meeting. Um, so, I mean, what I want you to do now is just basically, if there's anything else that you want to ask me, anything else specifically you want to talk about, connected with obviously what I do for a living or with what you do and, and with our culture generally, uh, then I'm happy to to uh, to answer it. I mean, I think, I, I think we covered it. In closing, here, just tell anyone who might not be familiar where they can find you. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm all over Facebook. If you do Facebook, you just put Facebook to the stop rover into Facebook. You'll find me, and there will be my, all my stuff. I'm, I'm, I do use these the um, uh, the the what's it's the the uh, streaming media. I'm on Spotify. Um, just put to the stop rover into Spotify. I'm on YouTube. Likewise, I've got a you know I've got a, a huge amount of material out there. I mean, all my albums are, are, are available for, for downloading and streaming and listening to. I'm also on Bandcamp. If you want to buy stuff, that's all there too. There's a huge resource of what I do on the internet. So if you're, if you're interested in what I've said, <coughs> check it out. And, um, you know, hi to everybody um, all, all over who's listening to this. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't I don't think I'll be coming back to the States. I've had some bloody good times there. And like you, I really did see the I – mean, I, I, I do get the, the, the good and the bad sides of the place. I'm not – uh, uh, somebody from the UK, you get people that think, every, especially on the left, think everything American is evil and disgusting. I certainly don't think that. And then you get the other side who think that everything American is wonderful, and I certainly don't get to do that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I have a very even-handed 
you know, I recognize the wonder and the beauty and the fantastic achievements that have happened in America. And I also recognize the utter shit that has started, really started with the, with the very first colonization in the, in the, uh, in, in, in the 16th century. Um, you know, so anyway, I'm, I'm off. I need to go. Um, Ron, it's lovely talking to you, mate. Very best of luck. Um, you know, and Thank we'll you. meet up again when you come, come over for the Edinburgh Fringe. Absolutely. Count on it. Thank you very much, Attila. That's great. Lovely. All the best. Cheers. That was Attila, the stockbroker. Be sure to check out all the stuff he has going on on his Facebook. His Facebook is incredible. He features other musicians. There's a discussion group. I'm active in it myself. Be sure to check it out. Music for the 1000 Podcast is by Andrew Saxon. Be sure to check out his podcast, the Baywatching Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. And leave us a five-star review, would you? This is still a pretty new show. So if you would, leave us a five-star review. It really helps out. And if you want to support this show on the sustainability end, you can do so over Patreon page patreon.com slash Ron Placone for a give what you can level. You get access to screenings of my films. You get uh, full stand-up clips not available anywhere else. I'll make you a theme song. Drew and I do a bonus podcast every month, and that's all for a give what you can level. So it's a really cool, fun community that you can become part of for as low as a dollar a month. All right, we are a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the percentage complete with this project. It's kind of it's kind of humbling when I think how much longer we have to go. Somebody did a percentage the other day. They were just like, "All right, you're at a <laughs> you're at this percentage of completion." But uh but we're almost we're almost at 30. We are almost at 30. We're at the this was episode 27, number of the 27 curse. See you next week. Hey guys, Ron Placone here. Take your own 1,000 challenge. No, you don't need to interview 1,000 people, although if you want to do that, go for it. Your 1,000 challenge can be whatever you want. Maybe you want to call a friend out of the blue once a week. Maybe you want to read a book every month. Maybe you want to start a different garden every season. I guess that might be dependent on where you live. Look, the point of the challenge is taking on an endeavor that enriches your life in some way, and it can be measured. And then, of course, you do it regularly. That's what 1000 is doing for me and hopefully for you too. The main reason for this podcast and every podcast I've ever done is to build community. So take your own challenge. Then join our Facebook group. It's called 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. That's 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. And post about what your 1000 challenge is and the progress you're making. All I ask is that people be encouraging of each other's challenges. This is personal and vulnerable, so be cool. There's enough negativity on social media. We don't need to add to it. For those of you who aren't on Facebook, hopefully in the future we'll be expanding to places like Discord, Reddit. But for now, we're starting on Facebook. And again, that Facebook group is called 1000 What's Your Challenge. See you there.